you don't want do not disturb doesn't work when you're on thank you everyone for coming tonight uh this yeah, wednesday may 11th um for the school department uh, budget session um work session uh, i'm going to pass it over uh, to the city manager uh, and we look forward uh, to the presentation tonight uh the questions and then again uh public comment will be at the end i see a number of the school board here as well so look forward to it thank you mayor and good evening everyone before i turn things right on over to superintendent steve zadervec i'd just like to express my thanks for um the wonderful working relationship we've had i'm sad i'm very sad this is our last budget together um and with that thank you the floor is yours Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, uh, City Councilors. Uh, we're here uh, tonight um, pleased to present to you the proposal from the Portsmouth School Board for the FY23 School Department budget. Uh, with me uh, to my left is Assistant Superintendent George Shea. To my right, Nathan Lunny, our business administrator, will be swapping off um, speaking duties for you tonight uh, to speak to some of the slides that we'll share with you. Um, you'll shortly have this presentation in your email if you'd like to follow along as well. Uh, also to recognize uh, many of our school board members who are here with us this evening and even our student rep McDonald <coughs> made a special effort to come out uh, for tonight's budget presentation so we appreciate all that support um, the process in developing a budget uh, really for us is driven by um, our overarching uh, mission and vision in the Portsmouth schools which has stayed consistent for a good number of years uh, we have um, for many years uh, had a hallmark of personalized learning, uh, really valuing what we typically call the three A's, arts, academics, and athletics, and making sure students are uh, career and college and citizenship ready as they leave our system. Our budget process, um, I just put this slide in front of you to uh, express how inclusive our budget process is. We have budget makers, because we are a, a large organization, that uh, filter down through the building levels, not only principals, but department heads, directors, coordinators. Uh, all of those folks have some responsibility in drafting the initial proposed budget. Uh, Nathan, George, and I meet with all of those budget makers through the month of December. And we go through line by line requests. We look at where we can uh, put one priority here in place of another there. Uh, and always uh, with an eye towards wanting to come in with a reasonable and responsible budget to uh, the school board initially. And so in, in January, we begin that process with the school board and present uh, the uh, first draft of the uh, operating budget. Uh, work with the school board through a number of work sessions through January and February to ultimately um, come back to um, you know sub in the, in the middle of that hearing guidance that might exist from the council uh, but essentially move that budget to the city manager in February uh, for inclusion into the city's budget proposal to you our budget has and continues to be driven by the goals that exist in the school department uh, endorsed by the school board and first and foremost among those is a goal around equity and when we talk about equity we talk about um, student uh, different gaps of uh, opportunity and achievement we see in students uh, these uh, can be groups of students you could characterize by uh, socioeconomic status free and redu reduced lunch racial um, identification uh, identification as special education uh, all of these things are, are data points we look at and we have had a goal to close gaps of opportunity and achievement uh, for some number of years so our budget priorities while you won't see them as a main um, uh, one point component of the budget filter through all of our budget conversations so things like for example professional development uh, we will uh, target money uh, that we have in um, in different years to uh, achieving goals staff training etc around these issues Steve if I might interrupt the yep. council should have the presentation in your email inbox if you'd like to follow along thanks um, and I won't go through in great detail in terms of the goals uh, they exist I know you've also also seen copies of our uh, budget view book we uh, publish each year uh, which has a little more narrative to some of those goals and how each school is moving forward uh, through that uh, but our second goal around opportunity really has been driven by some of our work uh, in expanding early opportunities for students uh, that is uh, in terms of preschool we have a preschool program 
that's housed at Little Harbor, for example, that primarily services our special education population, but we've been making that a more inclusive program over the last couple of years uh, to include students into that. Uh, but where we've really seen tremendous growth uh, has been around dual enrollment in college level classes at the high school. Opportunities for students to take college level classes while they're at Portsmouth High School. Uh, we have expanded whether we're talking about through our career and technical education programs or through uh, running start classes, other running start classes, other agreements we have with Southern New Hampshire University, Great Bay Community College, and, uh, and also recently UNH to uh, make sure that we're not only preparing students for college, but we're actually giving them a leg up. And so many of our programs uh, contain a, a significant number of credits, college credits students can earn before they leave high school. And this has been, a, again, a tremendous area of growth for us over the last few years. Uh, our goal around community, of course, uh, is something that we, we always strive to engage our full community. And that's not just our parental community, that's our community partners. I know, um, again, I'll use the example of CTE. We uh, leverage uh, community uh, partnerships with uh, local industries that are related to our programs, such as automotive, culinary, uh, et cetera. I know recently um, the CTE students have worked with our economic um, division and looking at um, some partnerships with the city uh, that we continue to have uh, and enjoy, and really all for the purpose of setting up students for success. <clears throat> and student wellness, which is a goal that we've had, we had pre-COVID, but certainly uh, throughout the last couple of years in the pandemic, uh, this has taken on a whole different meaning and a whole different level of intensity for us. And you'll see as we get through some of the asks that we're putting forward in additional positions, for example, uh, many of them are directed to trying to uh, adapt and respond to the, the effect that the pandemic has had on students uh, emotionally, socially, as well as academically. Uh, and I'd say, again, we, we do pride ourselves on uh, high expectations and a high standard for excellence. Uh, we enjoy uh, that recognition uh, across the state and in many areas nationally. Uh, top rated programs, again, not just academics, but uh, performing arts, uh, athletics. Uh, as an example, you could pick many rating agencies to uh, to look at, um, the, um, these are the, uh, the niche uh, rankings for most recently for the schools in the district. Again, depending on which ranking agency you're looking at, maybe jockeying among those uh, top positions in the state, but we certainly enjoy um, top rankings in, in many areas, which I think we're just one slide behind. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so again, you can see uh, many of those, um, our schools uh, indeed um, have that reputation throughout the state. Uh, demographically, uh, we uh, certainly have, um, have seen some trends there as well. Uh, we are uh, over 20% non-white in our student population right now. We have seen more diversity, thankfully, I think, in our communities uh, around um, our student population, we'll talk a little more about that in a second. Our free and reduced lunch population, that's a, that's a misleading number, 10%, where our, our population we know is larger than 10%. Typically it's hovered between 15 and 20 district wide, in some schools closer to 30. Uh, but the reality with the pandemic is, as you may know, f uh, free and reduced lunch, lunch is free for everybody. So there really is no incentive per se for families to fill out the paperwork to be identified as free and reduced lunch eligible and across not only the state but I'm sure nationwide that's had an effect on what is categorized and reported to the state as free and reduced lunch students. Um, and you'll see uh, again our English language learners which again is a is a growing number for us. In fact if you look at the uh, languages that exist uh, in our school system they uh, number over 30 and are very diverse in where our students are coming from. This also filters a little bit into some of the requests that we're putting forward to you uh, in that we see, um, we see slow incremental increase in our numbers, but we also see increase in the uh, complexity and the uh, intensity of student need as they come. We have many coming with little to no uh, English background and, uh, and sometimes coming from places uh, where there's also trauma involved and other factors. And so 
um, our focus on ELL students and our people who are focused on uh, servicing them, uh, we have certainly seen um, a lot of more intense work going on across all the schools. Um, I'd call your attention to our enrollment trends as we get them. These come from uh, this year from NESDEC, New England School Development Council, which uh, does this for districts and looking at birth rates, uh, extrapolating out um, using their uh, you know, data uh, methods to do a 10-year student enrollment projection. I would put an asterisk in this case, which is that the most recent data they are using, of course, is the data from the pandemic where, uh, like many schools, we did see a drop, uh, a drop in some uh, student enrollment. Uh, and we assume and expect that that has, and even this year we've seen it, will be a, a recovery. So especially the elementary numbers you see there, um, they are projecting a slight and gradual decrease in our numbers. Um, and we'll be watching carefully over the next couple of years to see how much of that holds true. But if you think about our enrollment projections, and I think in the other book you'll see a graph of it, it's fairly stable here in Portsmouth, whereas other communities around us have seen a dramatic decline in student enrollment. Uh, we've had a fairly predictable and stable uh, student enrollment across the district. But this will factor in, as it has the last couple of years, to some of our staffing as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to George to talk a little. Sure. I'll just speak briefly on uh, on assessment uh, for learning and assessment of learning in Portsmouth schools. Most of our assessment is designed to inform our instruction, to show us what kids need at a specific time, what they need to be able to do and do next, and what obstacles need to be removed. Uh, it also allows us to provide feedback to students, uh, timely and specific feedback that helps them with their learning in real time. And that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, is those local assessments. What I'm sharing here is the uh, federal accountability assessments that are used under the ESA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, that are the uh, dipsticks that are taken at grades three through eight and then grades 11 in English language arts, mathematics, and science. Science is grades five, eight, and 11 only. So if you look, this is just a snapshot of last year's data. And I would say for us, it, when you look at all of these, this is 2021, which was our main COVID year coming off COVID. Uh, nationally and statewide, those numbers are significantly suppressed. But if you look relatively uh, where we stand to the state of New Hampshire, it's consistent with our usual gaps there uh, with our differentials between us and, uh, and the state. Mathematics is something that we've talked a lot a lot was probably the, the skill most affected by uh, the pandemic and remote and hybrid learning experiences more so than English language arts and reading and, and literacy. Um, so you can see those those are numbers that are usually lower than where we are and we have the historical ones as, as well but relative to the state we're fairly high and the next would be uh, English language arts which you can see are well taller and therefore higher and therefore larger numbers. Um, and these, oh, these numbers show the percent proficient. So this, these are scored on a one through four basis, uh, going substantially low proficient to distinguished. And they combine the top two categories for federal accountability to determine proficiency. So when you see grade three, 70% proficient, that's what that assessment is. Next one is science, which again is done in grades, only in grades five, eight, and 11. You can see the differentials there. The SAT, we did the longitudinal version just so you could see a few years and it wasn't just two columns. Um, so the SAT is, is accepted by uh, the U.S. Department of Education as the 11th grade indicator uh, under ESSA. In the 2020 year, that was during the spring of 2020 when that's administered, and that was elective that year. That's why our numbers are so high. The other years, we make everybody take them take it. Uh, but in 2020, that spring, it was it was only those who really wanted to take it. Um, we're currently in the process of administering this now. So it's a spring assessment, and we uh, will have this year's data probably in the next three weeks. That's it for me. So coming back to the budget requests for FY23, we'll take a moment to review some of the major budget drivers. Uh, as we'll talk about, particularly around positions, our needs around special education 
uh, have increased. Uh, we do see increased numbers as well as, again, increased intensity in some of the student needs we have. And these are all driven by students' individual education plans or IEPs. These are uh, legally binding documents in terms of services we need to give to students. And so uh, we always look at our special education staffing and needs in relation to what those IEP demands are. Uh, COVID pandemic, I would also point out that a lot of the, um, the, whether we're talking about learning loss or mental health needs or other student needs, uh, we certainly had a lot of conversations around uh, what's, the, what's the proper amount, what's the reasonable amount of staffing to think about uh, in terms of addressing some of those needs. So you'll see requests for tutors academically. You'll see uh, some of the guidance staff in the, that we've taken another look at. Uh, but I would say, um, and we'll get to this later, we're also considering the use of ESSER funds around some of those needs, anything that is COVID-related. Uh, we certainly have had conversations um, in the short term as well as the long term of what the best use of those funds uh, would be. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, as you, you're well aware of, uh, a large part of any budget uh, increase or budget driver is the commitments as uh, contractually bargained through CBAs. Uh, health insurance, as I think you heard again this week through um, City Manager and Finance Director Belanger, um, school runs on a, a separate 10-year rolling average with school care for the uh, rolling increase, and that stands this year at 5.4%. Uh, and also uh, transportation, I would say that uh, we had made a significant reduction in transportation last year because we actually uh, continued to have a shift in start times that created, um, I won't get into the many details, but the ability to tier the buses again. So rather than run all 16 buses at the same time, because everybody was starting at the same time roughly, we were able to do elementary first and then middle and high school. Um, and what we found in that is that we have, were able to reduce three buses. We found that constraint a little too challenging this year. We had a lot of bus issues to start the year and, and Nathan has been managing most of that even throughout the year. So we would contemplate adding back one bus uh, for a route into the fold for next year. Um, budget recovery, this is uh, again dialing back to last year, um, not to say this, this is a, a huge factor right now, but uh, we, last year's proposal with the council we had eliminated a net reduction of 5.8 positions. We're not asking for all of those positions to come back, by the way. Uh, in fact, two of those reductions were because of enrollment. And so we are looking at that enrollment and trying to make sure that the staffing is adjusted accordingly. And so um, the positions that you'll see as, a, as an increase this year are not just a simple add the 5.8 back and then add more. Uh, we actually each year look at which positions we restructure uh, and so we are not proposing bringing back um, the 5.8 positions per se. Now, having said that, if I'm dialing back many years ago, we did make reductions in counseling and related services that actually we are feeling the pressure of particularly right now. Uh, and that is, again, an area we are addressing. Um, one thing, though, that is a recovery is last year, part of our reduction in the budget was a reduction of over $300,000 of just operating expenses that we assumed we could find ways to cover through the use of ESSER funds uh, and make, um, make use of that. And so as a starting point this year, we certainly um, didn't, never intended that to be a long time uh, reduction year over year. We, we added back the 300,000 in operating into those budget lines uh, to begin this year. All of that put us at a, a starting point last year um, at 5.2% just for a continuing services budget and again, through the 5.8 reduction, the 300,000 reduction, uh, total, total reductions over about 1.2 million, uh, we had a final budget increase of 2.78 uh, last year. So um, that would bring us to where we are this year. Uh, and this year we see the salary lines. Again, this is uh, absent uh, any other collective bargaining um, uh, impact that's ongoing right now, but a 3.6% increase in salaries based on existing contractual steps, et cetera, as well as um, any track changes or movement people do in their um, salary scale. Uh, the corresponding benefit increase, again, much driven by that uh, health insurance increase. Total operating, again, with the restoring of that 300 plus thousand at 11.4% total, bringing us to a total budget increase of about 4.95%. 
and a total FTE increase of a little over 10. So to dive down a little bit deeper into that, um, our whole, if you take the whole budget increase and break that off into various categories, you can see how that's broken off into all of the categories, including health insurance, the restoring of the 300,000 um, related taxes, et cetera. So that's just to help you get a sense of what the increase represents uh, in the budget this year. So diving into the um, positions now a little bit more, we have, again, come back to some positions that are uh, have actually been a need because of uh, factors, uh, various factors. So for example, we increased the time of our preschool program as we increased the opportunity for um, students to access preschool. And in doing so, we had to add incremental increases of paraprofessionals so it's often odd to see a 0.43 or a 0.14. That doesn't necessarily represent some odd part of a person, but it might be an increase in hours for existing people is what, the, what we're representing. Uh, board Certified Behavior Analyst, a BCBA, is a position that helps with a lot of uh, more severe behavior management issues at all of our schools. Currently, we have one BCBA across the district and we contract out with various organizations for the rest. And every time we do that and we find that our contracting out is actually costing us as much or more than actually having a person, we contemplate adding the position rather than contracting it out, uh, which gives us a lot more flexibility and control over how those services are delivered. So the addition of the 1.0 BCBA is also offset by the uh, reduction in the contracted service. Um, case may, as I mentioned before, we have a few positions related to special education, the increase in needs there, including a case manager, a speech pathologist, occupational therapist, all of those relate to those needs. Um, a guidance position at the middle school, that's also a restructure related to special education, uh, but one of the needs that we've had and seen is to actually uh, put in another regular counselor into the mix, so it actually is um, is, is not an ad of a person per se, but the, per, but the position is in now in the general fund because it's a regular guidance position, which is why it's an ad here. Um, at the same time, it's not being funded by a, by a grant. Um, and again, the uh, academic recovery, you can see uh, attention to a math tutor as well as reading support. Uh, all of those things filter into uh, academic recovery. And as George says, we see a particular area of need in math and also expanding our capacity for intervention uh, across students so that we can uh, have the best supports to uh, really close those gaps that did, that did indeed widen over COVID. And lastly, as I mentioned, in terms of our ESL or ELL population, we have in more intense needs. Uh, this budget would include a paraeducator para position that would be focused primarily on uh, new arrivals, if you will, for students coming from various countries and um, acclimating them into the schools um, and really serving as, as a in more intense support early on in each of those um, transitions. Uh, also, in increase in staffing, as uh, you probably are aware of, we are uh, reclaiming, if you will, the athletic director position into the school budget. Uh, we have enjoyed a relationship with the rec department around some of our athletic director services, uh, but it, I think in terms of visioning out what athletics might be both on the rec side and the school side, this made sense. And so we uh, have an inclusion of a full-time position. While again, there is an offset because in the budget we still carry about a $50,000 uh, contribution to what was the MOU with the rec department. So a dollar figure, it's not uh, as impactful as the full salary. Um, the halftime elementary uh, teacher is actually a, a contribution to make whole uh, an opportunity that we have from the Italian government right now. We uh, this year uh, secured a grant from the Italian government to fund elementary Italian in our schools, which has been a great opportunity, has been extremely popular, and a wonderful connection for our, com our community, which has, as you know, a lot of Italian heritage. And so, um, as the board has talked about elementary world language for years and years, this was just an opportunity that we seized to actually, number one, get some experience of world language into the elementary schools, but also leverage uh, the willingness of the Italian government to help support that. And so we have made application for a continuation of a grant, 
which if we were to add a 50% of a position would make whole a position to do that at the elementaries next year. Uh, the board also had supported um, a curriculum leader position. This was a position to help address, this has been an ongoing conversation in the district around the needs for curriculum coordination. Uh, in the timing of the transition in the role of superintendent, et cetera, it was contemplated not only to lessen the impact on budget, but also to allow the new superintendent to have some say into the position. It, it was contemplated as a half year, that is to say a hire that could happen perhaps closer to January. Uh, for a curriculum leader position in the district. Uh, as well, uh, th I think the board supported a, um, a library aide at the high school, uh, a long-standing request, honestly, for a number of years that has been made, um, and that would be an additional uh, 0.47, again, because we have um, part of positions already. And so, again, summary, in terms of those special ed and student need-driven positions, that's uh, almost eight of those 10 plus positions and the others representing about 2.47 in those uh, asks. I'll turn it over to Nathan to talk a little more about ESSER. This is obviously something that's been current in our conversations around budget as well. The Congress, it was um, very much predictable that a, a budget request um, would would also engender the question about how are you spending all the federal dollars. So we wanted to just remind the council. Um, the school board has been briefed uh, multiple times in their meetings. Uh, they have uh, reached out multiple times for public comment and uh, feedback, have held forums, and are continuing to gather uh, information and feedback about a spending plan. There have been three rounds of ESSER funding. ESSERs one, two, and three, they call them now. Uh, ESSER being the elementary and secondary school relief, uh, emergency relief funds. <coughs> the first came about with the CARES Act. Uh, the, deadline, um, the deadline is upon us. Those dollars were spent in, in the first few months of, uh, of the return to school uh, inside the pandemic, spent largely on PPE, uh, plexiglass. Uh, there was some uh, additional instructional support that the teachers offered uh, in that COVID summer. But there are two ESSER funds that stand uh, ready for us to use that the board is continuing to deliberate on. ESSER 2 came about uh, as a result of the CRISA, the CRISA Act. It is just over $1.2 million of funds that have to be spent by September of 23. And ESSER 3, uh, the ARP Act, uh, American Rescue Plan Act that you're familiar with, uh, brings $2.76 million to Portsmouth. That, includes a 20% mandatory set aside to address learning loss and has a deadline for spending of September of 2024. This year, uh, some funds have been spent that seem appropriate to fall under ESSER 2 or 3. Uh, we've not completed the application process with the Department of Education here in New Hampshire. This is a, an apply and approve, spend and reimburse process with the New Hampshire Department of Ed. So as the board continues to deliberate and finalizes their plans, then we can look at what is compliant uh, or, or um, eligible as uh, expenditures. But it, it, it largely is still the case that all of the $4 million is in front of us. Uh, if you hit the next slide, I would offer up to you that in the most recent presentation that we did to the school board April, I think, uh, we updated the plan and offered some some uh, suggestions about how the dollars might be spent. And right now, as the plan, as the plan stands, as it's proposed, roughly two-thirds of the dollars would be spent on infrastructure. Nearly all of that uh, uh, air conditioning upgrades in the elementary schools and in the high school areas that are not currently air conditioned. The air conditioning demand at the, at the uh, Little Harbor School and at uh, the Dondero School would combined cost us probably in excess of $5 million. So we're not able to tackle the entirety of those buildings, but we're looking at uh, an, a significant chunk of space at each of those buildings and a wing of the high school on the second floor that continues to, to be without. Beyond that, uh, there are dollars in the plan for learning loss as is mandated. In that, there, we've broken it out to address learning loss being served by staffing impact as well as learning loss by program. In working with the board, we've been, uh, we've been uh, real vocal all along that we should do what we can to try to avoid adding human capital to the grants so as to avoid 
the cliff effect and having positions needing uh, needing to impact our budget for continuation at the end of the funding stream. Right now, there there are three that have been identified as as pressing needs that seem to be well served uh, under the under the ESSER funds. One of those is a social worker position. Another is an, uh, an outdoor education position serving initially elementary needs and another an interventionist at the high school. The plan right now calls for fully funding those three positions in this coming year one. And in the second year, they would be a 50-50 split district funds in the 24 budget and the ESSER funds graduating into the third year, them being fully funded in the district. So that's a that's a future conversation, but for right now, there are three positions that are planned um, in the ESSER learning loss uh, portion. Beyond that, uh, instructional technology, continuing to work on Chromebooks largely, and other instructional uh, supports, uh, technology supports, and uh, and there's another 2% of um, uh, some miscellaneous uh, material uh, that would support uh, the return to school and the recovery from COVID. One of the challenges uh, that the Department of Ed has, has laid out, or the U.S. Ed really has laid out, is that these dollars must pass the litmus test of being related to COVID in that they must prepare for, prevent, or respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, that has been part of that public conversation with the board and as yet not fully decided, but wanted to make sure you had some sense of how they, they were planning on using those $4 million. So, and that's, that's our presentation for you. Entertain any questions? Thank you, uh, and I will echo the, uh, the city manager's sentiments and be uh, sad to see you go down the road. Um, but I'm sure we will uh, see you around uh, Portsmouth uh, in years to come. But um, I'll open up to the council for questions. Council Murrow. Um, you talked about the ESSER funds being able to cover a lot of infrastructure, so I'm just curious as to whether or not some of those projects that might be covered under that would then lessen what's on the CIP plan as of now. I, I, th I think the, the quick answer is <coughs> no. Right now, the plans that are included there are new infrastructure, new air conditioning that haven't yet made the hit list on CIP in the conversation that we've had in the last couple of years that I've been here. So uh, it wouldn't, would not necessarily offset anything in that six year plan. Councilor Bagley. Um, I'll follow up on Councilor Murrow's question. You mentioned uh, Dondero and uh, Little Harbor, I think, with the AC. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, uh, New Franklin School is in the CIP. And that's a current project happening. It's already underway. Some of the initial infrastructure, the electric and such, are underway. That'll be complete at the end of the summer. All right. I just wanted to mention that because I know that. Thank you. <laughs> if you mention two of the elementary schools and leave one out. Um, yeah, and that one, and I it, thank you. That's really an important element. And New Franklin, as it sits there between the highways, uh, is will be fully air conditioned, stem to stern. Thank you. Um, if you're on a couple more questions. Um, appreciate the breakdown of the additional positions um, especially pleased to see the three that you're contemplating with the Essler funds um, as we know COVID has been a generational or once in a lifetime hopefully challenge for the, the kids my biggest concern um, as a parent who's uh, had a child going through this and you know it's seen it firsthand you, you understand how uh, much more of an effect it has on children than it than did most adults. Uh, concern to me is is the younger kids coming into kindergarten to first grade. Do we have the resources we need? Um, because they're going to be probably not quite where you know kindergartners and first graders would be normally, because uh, such a large percentage of their life, you know, 50% of their life has been dealing with COVID. Do we feel like we have the para professionals and the the teachers aides and uh, those positions in particular? Do you think we're in a good position yeah so well you, you've hit on a, a request that that certainly has been um, an, a, a long-standing request honestly to, and, and it sort of varies because another factor is class size at the kindergarten level so we're talking about what other supports are necessary in the regular kindergarten classroom 
Uh, right now, this budget does not include um, paraprofessionals, for example, in, in every kindergarten. It is a conversation, though, that, that we have been having and may tie that into continued ESSER conversations. Um, not likely to, um, to, to Nathan's point, add 10 more positions that we'd have to contemplate long term, but maybe strategic and targeted into areas that, um, that might be um, impacted the most because of class size. Right now, um, not across every classroom or school, but we, our kindergarten enrollment is down a little bit this year so far. Um, and so we usually wait to see how that kindergarten enrollment trails out, which isn't quite certain yet to decide what other kind of resources might be necessary. But it is it is a conversation uh, for us. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Boa. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you very much for the presentation. And I uh, just want to thank you all. I'm a graduate of Portsmouth School System, so I, many, many thanks. Um, and looking at this budget, um, we're adding some things. Um, I do, certainly the last thing I would want to do is affect the education of our youth in Portsmouth or the support. Um, looking at this budget, what would be the first thing that you could possibly do without? Or is this, um, we can't do without any of this, or, you know, I mean, or is this more of a perfect world? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's it's a, always a conversation about priorities, and so uh, the hypothetical, if you were to say, you know, find two hundred thousand dollars or whatever that might be, um, I guess we would we would do what we've done before, which is apply the standard of w what would have the least impact, direct impact on students in the first instance. So um, probably wouldn't be recommending things like the social worker or other supports we put in specific for COVID recovery. Um, but, um, for example, I mentioned the half-year curriculum position. Um, if you were to say, and this would be a board conversation, of course, but if you were to say to me, let's reduce it a bit, for, I'd, I'd probably go back and say maybe that's something you could wait till next year, um, as well as the addition of the, the library paraprofessional. Not to say it's not needed, yeah. um, but if we have to prioritize, those would be some recommendations. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Cook. Um, thank you, Your Honor, uh, and thank you so much, Superintendent, for presenting this budget to us. Um, I have a question that's probably going to cross um, between schools and general budget because it's about the athletic director position. And um, as you know, I'm new to the council, so I wasn't around when the decisions were made on changing, altering the athletic director kind of funding and the way that we um, hired for that role. So um, I was hoping someone could explain to me how, why we decided to go from covering both to having individual directors across. Can we take a stab at that? Sure. And chime in and catch what I don't. With, um, with the opportunity to restructure uh, the athletic director position after the untimely death of Russ Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, there was consideration for how recreation was staffing its staff and how the athletic department was stood up. And essentially, the athletic director was a recreation supervisor with a stipend from the schools. Do I have this right? So um, <coughs> both recreation and the school board um, acknowledged over a period of time that it made sense to, once again, um, divest the two, if you will, that to keep the, com the position combined would be to do a disservice to each of the roles. So um, with this budget, we will formally acknowledge that recreation has a recreation supervisor back to be full-time rec supervisor and the AD or the athletic director will serve as full-time in that position. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, part of your question was around hiring. So um, so as you probably know, the, that rec employee, Tom Kazakowski, had been serving in that role as a rec employee. Uh, we did, though, go through an open process of advertising and hiring and, and recruiting, and uh, and still yet, and very uh, happy to say, he rose to the top to continue as the athletic director, which is great for us. Uh, I know a loss to the rec department, but um, but for operationally, um, it allows us to also consider more of a district-wide lens, um, because one of the things the board has talked about is really thinking about athletics and broad, more broadly, wellness and what role uh, somebody in that position as solely focused on the district could help and you know, build out that vision. So that's something we're hoping to do. Okay, thank you. I have a few Another more. question? Yeah, I have a few more if it's okay. 
Um, since we have seen some declining enrollment, is there any chance that some of these positions won't be uh, increased? I know, I know a lot of them are increases in time or, or funded or hired because we um, don't need them because our enrollment hasn't increased. Yeah, if if we were proposing elementary teachers, I guess that would be the one thing I would I would say I'm not sure we need, but we're not, we're not. Um, all of the needs that you see in the additional positions for our enrollment and our projected enrollment next year are needed. Uh, although you know the enrollment trends, as you saw, this is an ongoing conversation around how do we look at staffing, um, and do we have opportunity to. Um, in some cases, as we did with those two positions last year through attrition, you know, look at right-sizing the staff based on that enrollment. So with that reduction made last year, we don't see um, opportunity to, to make that reduction again this year, although I do think that's an ongoing conversation. And I think my final question is about the um, second set of, uh, the third set actually of ESSER funds and um, the funding of positions through ESSER funds. Um, I do have some concerns around that. Um, so we already, I believe, we're getting a grant from a grant this year that's going to offset some of these budgetary increases um, that, that's not, it's not necessarily reflected here. Um, that, um, so next year we can automatically anticipate if this budget stays the way it is and we don't have additional increase, increases, an increase on personnel and loss of grant funds that are currently offsetting some of the increase. Um, so then if we also hire three individuals, we can anticipate uh, 1.5 FTEs in addition to that next year, just automatically um, beyond the ESSER spending, or is this ESSER spending anticipated to be 2003 and 2004 for those positions? So that I, I can try. The number that you, the 1.5 made sense to me. It sounded right. But I would say uh, those three positions would not have a fiscal impact in 23. Mm -hmm. They would be fully funded under ESSER as, the, as they planned. In 24, there would be three halves, so 1.5 FTEs that would impact the budget, and another 1.5 for the other half of them would impact in the subsequent year. Okay. So it would not be a 23 impact half of those people would hit us in 24 and the other half would follow. So it would, 1.5 new, mm -hmm. 1.5 new FTE in 24, the entire 3.0 hitting in the budget of 25. I'd also jump in to say, and I wouldn't characterize all of these positions certainly in this way, but, but some of this is about short-term recovery. Some of this is about, I mean, tutors to let's bring kids back up to speed, let's, let's make sure that we can uh, do the best we can to recover the academic as well as the social emotional. Um, but that may not speak to long term need for this continuation of all of those positions. And I would make the same wondering about the outdoor ed position, which is to say that in, it, in its contemplation for next year is about building capacity of classroom teachers. Um, and uh, it would be for the board's conversation, certainly next budget cycle, to think about what is that need in subsequent years. Um, but. Uh, but I don't also want to characterize all of these positions as this is all set and now we're just going to keep adding on. Thank you and so I would, much. I would also just add that part of the requirements of receiving the ESSER funds are this continuous uh, polling of our stakeholders and community about how they would like those funds spent. So a lot of these positions are in response to those. I think we've done now two rounds of, of surveying the community about what they think the needs are for the schools. and. A lot of these positions are responsive to that, um, and as Steve said, might be short-term uh, types of uh, interventions. Thank you. Councillor Tabor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Steve, it's been great working with you over three budgets, and, uh, and prior to that with Portsmouth Listens, and, but it's nice to know you'll still be around in the area. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I think we talked last year, and testing was not showing dramatic amounts of learning loss. Um, but a year has gone by. Are we starting to see some of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at, you don't see it as much in the in the big uh, national tests as as much as we do in our local assessments. And yes, as I mentioned before, when we look at, and I presented this to the school board earlier. We, 
we do a sort of annual um, dipstick around February or so, and, and that wasn't showing much last year. Um, but this year we did see a significant decrease in growth for the most part. And, and when we look at growth, we're looking at what students what students are able to do from one grade to the next, not necessarily looking, looking at actual students, not looking at grade three from this year to next year, but looking at a student from one year to the next. And, and those growth percentages have decreased, I said, and more so in mathematics than in reading, which I, I think during the, the pandemic and the, the hybrid and remote learning phases, it's more likely that students were able to receive support and find and do more independent study in, in literacy and English language arts than they were in mathematics. Okay, so um, it, it's proving real. Um, so which, could you just guide us to which of your new FTEs are, are being put against that problem? Yeah, so in the, in the first instance, the math tutor uh, at the middle school uh, is designed specifically to continue our work already around intervention with middle school. What we haven't had, and this isn't actually in the operating budget here, but as Nathan mentioned, for use of ESSER funds, we're looking at math intervention at the high school. Uh, we have, uh, at the elementary level, some of this factors into our use of Title I funds also, which could be used for either literacy or math. Uh, and how do we support some of the continuation of the work that we're doing. So again, trying to leverage more than just the operating budget, but to have impact into that, that issue, but primarily through what we consider tier two services beyond regular classroom instruction, what extra help do students need? Right. And are we still using the ESSER funds for part-time tutors to yeah, so the, the interventionist, uh, as I said, at the particularly at the, um, at the high school is, is contemplated through use of ESSER funds. And we, uh, you know, we're trying to expand out uh, our use of, of tutors. Uh, many of our paraprofessionals who already exist also play a role in some of this. And so, um, but hiring specific tutor positions that are dedicated to small group instruction for students in math is something we've we've gradually expanded right we've never had that at the high school we've had a reading specialist at the high school but no math interventionist until mm -hmm. um, and then this the special ed FTE uh, and the English as a second language paraeducator um, are those needs that have just gone unmet or are we seeing populations that are increasing there that we need to address yeah more more the latter honestly John we we, we see um, we have seen an increase in special ed need um, whether it be COVID related or otherwise a part of a trend we we definitely see that so the additional uh, case manager is is something to help uh, address that need uh, and as I said the same with the ESL paraeducator this is a this is more of a, a recent need in the level of intensity that we're seeing students come in as i said not just um language issues but real complex family issues of, of families moving to the community and this would be a person who would almost act as a case manager for newcomers and, and working through those issues and be itinerant our existing esl uh, teachers have caseloads and students that they service on a schedule throughout the day but we have families that will end here and come into the schools and, and have very intense needs for the beginning of their time, the first few weeks, and, uh, and require a lot of support. And right now, our existing teachers with, with caseloads and schedules want to support these families as much as possible. So they, they move away from the students they're supposed to be supporting and, and help out these families for short-term fixes. And this would address those. Thanks. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's been an excellent presentation. I, um, I, one of the things that I've seen and read about is that um, because of kids being home a lot and not in preschool even, uh, the uh, elementary schools are, are finding that, uh, and I I'm not saying this here, but just in general, that are finding that uh, kids lack the socialization that they would normally have by being in daycare and things like that. Um, I, I noticed in the budget uh, there's um, a lot of the uh, smaller cost centers have the largest percent 
increases, and it seems to correlate with your efforts to um, bring some specialty people in uh, to deal with, with those issues, uh, not just in elementary, but throughout the system. So um, you've answered most of my questions, but I just wanted to bring that up and just recognize that. Yeah, thank you. I had a quick question on the uh, <clears throat> the math assessment, uh, or the assessments in general. It's tough to read them, uh, I guess, uh, without more data. Like, I guess one of the questions I would have would, <clears throat> are, are third graders just much smarter than our eighth graders <laughs> were? Like, I mean, I mean that seriously, I guess, are we, is it, uh, you know, is it, would it be generally expected that uh, the proficiency falls off, and has that been a trend in terms of third through eighth in in math versus the state? The state might have a, you know, it looks like we're getting closer to the <clears throat> to the state average as they get to eighth grade. Is that because that's just the the typical uh, expectation of eighth grade in terms of? proficiency or, or was this eighth grader who was once a third grader were they closer to the average back back then so our our growth numbers when you say this eighth grader as a third grader are, are similar with some of the numbers that I described when uh, Councilor Taylor asked about with smaller single digit digitus drops in in ELA English language arts and literacy and sometimes double digit as as cohorts of kids move through in in mathematics I would say the trend, this is not typical of the trend, but some of it is. Third graders are usually very high. Our first year of assessment, I don't know what ELA looks like. Eh, no, not, not particularly, but usually third grade's pretty high. Where we usually see a drop is going from fifth to grade six, and then the middle school slowly climbs up. This does not reflect that this year, um, but typically our, it's, our, it's our sixth graders that drop off, um, possibly the transition year a, a, a little <clears> bit. And then um, gradually creep up to to grade eight. So if you look at the the, L, the English language arts, that happened that year, but didn't quite make creep up at eight, but went up from six to seven, but had a significant drop from eighty five percent in fifth grade to sixty three percent in sixth grade. So yeah, I would I would echo the the trend you see, which seems like a fairly linear decline of, from uh, fifth grade on here. Uh, isn't what we see every year yeah. and when we look at these results um, as you can see with the state it kind of plateaus goes down but it hits more sure. plateau at the middle school which is more the the consistency we see and I, but I would say um, this is why intervention at the middle school and high school is a priority for us because we we have seen historically these gaps come closer to the state in the middle school level okay and then on the elementary school uh, <coughs> I uh, Excited Tiernan is going to New Franklin next year, yes. and we remembered uh, to do that uh, last week. So I don't know where your numbers were. Uh, one more, we, good. We need one more. more. <laughs> um, but our, your, you, you stated that we were slightly off elementary levels. Is that um, universal uh, across, evenly across the elementary schools? Uh, is it something <clears> that is we're one versus the others, and you know, not to bring this up, this is outside of our realm, but would we consider uh, changing the districts if we saw something more aggressively in, in one uh, elementary school versus another? Yeah, well, I'm not sure how much time we have tonight, but you hit on the, the, the issue that I think is the board's uh, work ahead, honestly. So yes, we do see disproportionate effects. We have actually seen an increase at Dondero pretty dramatically over the last five plus years and we've seen a corresponding decrease at Little Harbor and New Franklin has stayed somewhat level across all of that uh, but I do think uh, it is getting to the point uh, where um, where we need to be thinking about those boundaries now we've done other strategic things such as our preschool now is housed at Little Harbor because we have that opportunity uh, we have taken opportunity when a new uh, development comes on like the West End Yards to say okay well let's Let's put that to Little Harbor because that's that's where we have the space. And so, um, again, not necessarily assuming that has huge uh, student enrollment impacts at the elementary level, but just trying to make some of those uh, decisions. But uh, but clearly, we've done all we can do without actually redrawing so, to some level the, the lines and boundaries. And I think that's I think the school board is looking forward in the, the spring into summer to creating a committee to really start to dive into studying this. 
Um, but while you bring that up, I also bring up some of the other staffing changes we've contemplated through this. So, uh, for example, Little Harbor has, um, has a principal and an assistant principal position at the school, which historically has been necessary and, in fact, uh, required through minimum standards because the enrollment was so high in comparison to the other schools. And that's becoming less and less the case. And so that position actually has been serving, evolving into more of a district level elementary curriculum focused position um, because we do have need uh, to pay attention to some of those curricular elements across uh, the three schools consistently. And so um, trying to best utilize those positions across uh, as, a, as one example too, and I'll get back to Council Lombardi's comment about early um, impact with socialization, one of the uh, things that has been a body of work this year is to revamp and look at our social emotional curriculum, our SEL curriculum across the three elementary schools. Uh, and that's work that's ongoing to actually create programmatic elements through primarily the use of ESSER funds as we contemplate if we need to purchase a new curriculum that would be appropriate use of ESSER funds. Um, but it is a need and it exists across our three elementary school. So not only is there a shifting of need, but also the actual student numbers clearly has, has shifted. Um, and back to your initial question, uh, K enrollment is particularly down this year again at Little Harbor. Okay, and was that the, um, I'm trying to remember, was there a curriculum in terms of the additional, um, was that the, it was a half, uh, uh, a half year <clears throat> curricular leader position, was that the same position, the assistant principal is serving as that, or is that no? A that that position? was a new uh, position. So, in uh, much of the the reorganization around priorities, uh, the board had conversation about short term and long term goals in terms of looking at positions. So, a district level curriculum focus. While that's been one of I think thirty eight hats George has wear hmm. over the years, uh, we do have a need to think about curriculum focus more uh, isolated and focused, and so. Um, that half position was intended to serve in a broader district capacity, whereas the position I was talking about at Little Harbor is an existing position. The person in that position has already been doing work primarily around the area of math across our three elementary schools, and we would look to, to leverage that position as Little Harbor's needs for an assistant principal continue to decline, leverage that for increased value uh, with curriculum focus across the three schools. Okay, and then just on that uh, topic, the um, and uh, this is uh, you're, you'll be leaving us, Steve Z. Um, would you expect? Um, is there anything, I guess, in the the budget that um, you would expect a coming into a new role that uh, the next superintendent uh, would want to have greater control over versus? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, push you out of here, but is there a <coughs> expectation that some decisions that are being made ahead of the new will will box the next superintendent into a, a, a position where they're not able to be as effective as they might expect to be coming into it? Does that question make sense? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a fair tricky. question, Mary. I, I so I'd say a couple of things. Number one, um, uh, I've been working with my successor now for a while. Uh, on many of the transitional issues, hiring high school principal, et cetera, uh, so that that transition is smooth and, and well aware of. So he's um, certainly uh, has some knowledge of our budget requests and we've been working and having some conversations. Uh, but I would say the board had this conversation intentionally to think about that question in particular. So I would, I would mention one thing that's not included anywhere here. Uh, was, um, as some districts you may see around us have looked to hire a, a person whose real sole focus is diversity, equity, inclusion work across a whole district. Um, that is something that it was up on our list of priorities, but, um, but what we all agreed on is that's a key centrally um, administrative position. The next superintendent should have a lot of say into how that's structured and what that might look like. So, so no, I don't see anything on our existing uh, ask um, positions that I would say would, would box anybody in. And again, the only thing I would bring up uh, as, a, as, as something that uh, I just, I'm not sure um, if a mid-year hire is the best strategy to find the best person for a curriculum coordinator role, 
I would wonder if that, that may indeed be a conversation we have, which is to say, is that something we may just want to hold off until next year? And then last technical question for me, and Council, if you <coughs> have other questions, please jump in the, um, with the, with regards to the capital improvement plan, uh, Nathan, you stated that uh, these were outside the, the CIP. Um, what is the, um, I guess we, we have a, uh, a capital improvement plan to address the, the the needs from a capital perspective. Were these, and was maybe air conditioning rises uh, to that, not uh, foreseen before COVID, and so they they needed to be kind of jump the line in front of all of the other needs that, that we have as a as a school department? Can you walk me through how we, we decided to not look to the capital improvement plan and see what we could bring forward with additional money? Mayor, it's a great question. I think one of the one of the first one of the first conversation points was, "Wow, we've got this project envisioned at New Franklin to finish upgrading the air handling there, and, and in this case, install dehumidification and air conditioning." Uh, candidly, I think air quality and air handling has been talked about so much with in connection with the ESSER funds statewide, mm -hmm. every every conference, every you know every statewide event that I've had where the business community is talking about how do you, what do you, uh, air handling has been huge. And so I think there may have been a, an artificial inclination to lead to, you know, how, how, can we, how can we impact our schools. The reality is every year on the shoulder seasons, there's a lot of conversation about how hot it is in this space or how hot it is in the schools in general. And our schools uh, traditionally in the Northeast weren't, weren't built for uh, the same conditions that they are in sure. other parts of the country. And, uh, and so I think we went there. It was referenced uh, early on in some of the initial feedback that we got. Uh, I have to say that uh, equity, uh, not, excuse me, equity, infrastructure and air conditioning in general hasn't been one of the most loudly uh, echoed priorities. But we've worked really hard to recommend to the board that they avoid a lot of staffing with ESSER dollars because of that cliff effect, and instead look for as much as possible big ticket impacts, big big things that have long lasting benefit and impact on our schools, and air conditioning in those areas was was that. The other thing was that one of the reasons why it's been discussed so much is that it very easily passes the litmus test of, of tying itself to COVID. Some of the infrastructure things that we've dealt with, we're getting ready, Kenny's got a plan right now to replace the bleachers at the high school and there's um, uh, there's um, window repair and replacement at Little Harbor and Dondero. Uh, any number of things might pass the, the, the litmus, but uh, some of them certainly wouldn't. And in this case, it was uh, an opportunity to try to address some of those concerns, especially in light of the fact that we'd already put it high on the list and made New Franklin a priority before COVID hit. So on that, um, and this is only because we, and I don't remember this as a, as a kid who went to New Franklin uh, as, as maybe uh, as well as uh, kids that go uh, there now, um, but the, it did jump out to me, especially around the conversation around sound barriers, that New Franklin is uniquely positioned uh, differently than our other schools in that they are next to a um, highway. And so the ability to use window uh, cooling or opening the windows was not necessarily something that was available to them. Is it, is it I guess, your belief that uh, uh, cooling uh, for both uh, Little Harbor uh, and the high school rises to the same uh, level of need as New Franklin's um, given the, the inability to uh, I guess more naturally cool the, the, the school by opening the windows. I, uh, I, I think you ask, I mean, it's a great question and a great point, and I'm making a note now that before, the, before I offer any more advice to the board, I'll look back again at the CIP going out six years and even into the, into the next six years that Mr. Lynchy and I have reviewed uh, and see if there's anything there that, that passes the litmus test as well and could be uh, an offset. I think some of it was about the equity conversation because the decision to move forward with air conditioning was exactly as you said at New Franklin. It wasn't so much about cooling, it was being able to manage sound and climate at the same time. Uh, 
having moved forward with that and made that a priority, obviously there's a, an argument that there ought to be some, some similar cooling available in the other schools. Most of the high school is, and essentially the middle school is as well. So uh, part of the conversation, I think, really was about providing some level of equity around the city to the schools. And it's great that the middle school is now. I do remember that mm. it was limited by the, uh, the South Mill Point <clears throat> smell uh, <laughs> in terms of bad. opening that. <laughs> Low tide. <laughs> Low tide. Tough time. <coughs> Low tide. Councillor Bagley. Thank you, Your Honor. I just I listened to all this. I want to make a comment. Um, I didn't have the advantage of going to Portsmouth schools, uh, as many in the room did. But uh, my daughter is in the high school now. And you know her experience at Little Harbor was phenomenal. Uh, the middle school, even though challenging, uh, was really a shining star. And you know, high school's well, challenging not because of the school, but because of the age. And uh, I saw a stat today where about just under 20 percent of the families in, or the households in town have a child under the age of 18. So either in the school or about to be in the school. So that's if you think about it, it's roughly one fifth of the households. Um, but we all benefit as a community by having such strong schools that everybody wants to move to Portsmouth for. So, you know, the fact that we have such a good school system, even if you don't have children, uh, is, is an asset to you as a member of the community, and it's something we could all be proud of. Uh, and to touch on the mayor's point, uh, when we took the tour, when my daughter was going into sixth grade at the middle school, uh, seeing all the new areas in the classrooms, and then the sixth grade wing, which used to be the entirety of the middle school, it was kind of mind-boggling to think of how crammed in they must have been. So, you know, providing our children a first-class education, albeit expensive, I, I think is a benefit to not just parents, but the community as a whole. And I, I just want to thank you all for your work. Yeah, well, and I, I would echo back. I mean, this the schools have benefited from tremendous city support um, and, and forward thinking around that. Um, yeah, the middle school is a great example of, uh, of great community investment to create a school that can truly live up to that standard of excellence in dire need. And, and it's not lost on me as superintendent that not every community in this state has that opportunity. And so um, I think the city has done a great job to support schools. Councilor Denton. First, my apologies for arriving an hour late. It was the VFW's only monthly meeting and the final meeting prior to Memorial Day parade and ceremony. Um, I have two questions. If either of them have been asked, please just let me know, and I will look for the responses when I watch the video. Uh, the first one should come as no surprise to the superintendent. I'm not sure why that is. I'll give that a shot. Uh, the first question should come as no surprise. Um, starting six years ago, uh, my very first work session every year that was on the council since, I'd asked about the Farm to School Programs grant expiring, the USDA. Um, we were under the grant for at least two years. It was a great program. We had something in place, but the position itself wasn't funded, but there was funding made available for it. Uh, unfortunately, during the prior two years, likely due to COVID, um, the funding went elsewhere, and that position is no longer there. Uh, my understanding now is a number of the PTAs have stood up um, filling in the gaps, but it's not the same thing. And I'm just curious if there's been any thought on how we could help uh, bring back that program or something similar. Yeah, it's a great question, Councillor. And as you recounted the history, we, we enjoyed a grant that supported that work for a good number of years. Uh, and coinciding with the person leaving the position and other budget constraints, that was one of the 5.8 uh, positions last year that we chose not to uh, continue at this time. Uh, but that, to your point, that work does still continue. I mean, that position, again, was one of those positions was focused on building capacity. Uh, we have champions at each school around the farm to school and the use of, of gardens. Um, I, would, I would also say not that this is a, a big budgetary impact for us here, um, but also our school nutrition director, who is a major component in that work. Uh, we've been short-staffed all year around uh, cafeteria, and she literally has been out straight in cafeterias trying to plug holes this year. So, so I wouldn't characterize this year in particular as a lot of great forward movement in that area, but it's not lost on us that that's still a priority uh, for what we're doing. So in addition to, um, as I said, champions and, and the infrastructure set up, gardens at each school, et cetera, uh, we've enjoyed uh, the innovation of teachers to apply for things like the Clipper Foundation grants. 
some of which have been focused in on this um, sort of, whether it be gardens or greenhouses or et cetera, building out. Um, and so uh, really trying to use a, a multi-pronged approach to how we continue that work. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take the lack of the position as any signal that the work is not going to continue. Um, but I would also say, you know, it's an opportunity to recenter what those goals are and how we can move forward. Um, in the, while not specifically just focused on farm to school, that outdoor ed position is one of those positions that can help be a connector for some of the things that are going on. And if I may, the second question. Um, you had mentioned cafeterias, which is a great segue. I've heard from both teachers and from students that the composting is not what it was pre-pandemic. Um, could you either speak to that now or just as a follow-up, give us an update on that? Yeah, I would have to follow up unless Nathan has some better information about what, exactly the numbers, et cetera, where we are. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Councilor Lombardi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had the opportunity, being member of the um, Economic Development Commission, to be hosted by the culinary arts um, staff uh, for our last meeting. Uh, it was fabulous. I mean, it was those those kids did a fabulous job. Um, we had presentation by all the, not, probably not all the groups, but many of the groups that what we used to call shop, um, and um, all those young people were ex so excited about those programs. Um, it made me think. Well, we had a conversation with the commission afterwards about the expense of college and how many of us went to college but then never used <laughs> specifically, you know, what we learned. I studied biology and I ended up in tech. Um, you know, it's, and so the idea is, is how do you, you know, how do you change the culture of having to send someone to four-year liberal arts college to um, to getting into a program where you actually learn a, a real trade, uh, where you can walk out of high school, literally, and maybe some more training, and end up with a much higher paying job than what I got studying biology, you know, it's, um, <laughs> so I, my question is, is how do we advance those programs? Um, and also how do we um, educate the parents that that's a valid option as well? Because I think that, I think there's a problem there too. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that up. And first and foremost, a shout out to Courtney Richings, uh, our CTE director. Um, the opportunity we have in this community to build partnerships that open those pathways up for kids is just unbelievable. And, uh, and we've only begun, I think, to tap into that in ways. Um, but those programs exist. I'll, I'll shout out a proud dad moment. My daughter was one of the people who talked to you. Um, and. Uh, and there's just so many opportunities for our kids right now, and, and that's what we're trying to expand. Those early college numbers, uh, are the growth in that is primarily through our CTE programs because um, it's, it's just giving those kids a leg up and an opportunity. Um, and so I think it's a lot about uh, messaging. It's about communicating out to the community um, relentlessly. You know, one of the things I would say was a, was a factor in, in looking at our new high school principal was somebody who really had that focus and uh, and so we're, we're very pleased to be bringing on Steve Canosi as, as the next Portsmouth High School principal building partnerships is something that has been part of his past too and so uh, but I do think back to your point of how do you move that conversation with parents um, it's it's not an overnight because the four-year college and, and how people generally see it uh, you know it's, sometimes it's hard to crack into that a little bit but as as you mentioned as we can be clearer about what those opportunities mean um, in terms of growth, in terms of career, all of that, um, it really becomes a very compelling story to what those opportunities can be. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I guess PR and communicating and, and just making sure that we're really clear about those benefits. 
that wasn't really a, bu a budget question. But yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. All right. Councillor Tabor. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. So we see some slight declines in enrollment, and, and anecdotally we hear that during COVID uh, there were parents who opted for homeschooling, there were parents who opted for private school where there might have been more in-class time um, and less remote learning. Um, so my question is, in our budget, what are, how are we funding some of the areas of excellence to draw those students back? You know, I think, well, if I was a good athlete and I wanted to be on a championship high school lacrosse team, boys or girls, or a ski team, we could do that. A great drama program. Um, I could learn Italian now. <laughs> but um, what are, how does our budget um, boost some of our areas of excellence or create additional ones? Yeah, so, uh, you know, other than some of the things that we've talked about, I mean, the Italian is an example, um, but, but really trying to uh, make sure that, again, we're communicating, and that's what the publication you, you get um, is designed to do. We have these at the schools to, to look at prospective parents, et cetera. We continue to have people, thankfully, to, I mean, I think somebody mentioned it before, who move to this area because of the school, or at least tell us that that's a major factor in why they're moving here. Um, and I think the same holds true with those who maybe had gone to uh, off to a, a homeschool situation or whatever. We certainly have seen some of that return, particularly around the homeschool area, because a lot of those decisions were made very speci specifically for that, that COVID health component. Um, but I, I think it, it's, it is still about um, communicating with, with families, uh, highlighting some of the programs we have. Um, and and I, would, I would call out another example that's not in your budget per se, because it's funded through a different account, but uh, our Lister Academy program as another example. We, uh, as you're well aware, uh, would contemplate um, an opportunity to move that program to community campus. Uh, I think that changes the uh, public facing structure of that program. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for growth. Um, and while that's, that's the farther end of that attraction you're talking about, where we actually have odd students from out of district tuition into that program, um, I think it's gonna become even more attractive. Uh, we actually have seen an uptick of families who are privately asking to tuition their kids in, who don't live in Portsmouth, and those are a case-by-case -case kind of basis. But, um, yeah, I, um, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to take some uh, further suggestions on what those kinds of um, public messages could be to do that. But I do think we're seeing uh, a recovery from that um, in terms of some of the, the COVID uh, exodus, if you will, that we saw. Yeah, and if I could just add, I, I think part of when you talk about highlighting areas of excellent, excellence, I think a, a major attraction for us is our sort of vast array of extracurriculars and club activities that kids can choose from, it is really um, astonishing. And a lot of those are generated by students, created by students, and, and we just create the, the space for those. But also in our ESSER funds uh, is our funds dedicated to extended day learning opportunities. So when you look at families that may be uh, looking for a longer day, more enrichment opportunities, more experiences for kids, we've, we've also built in funds for that because that's a direct response to, to COVID. Uh, to have that extended day enrichment. So um, those are pieces that we're sort of using to, to market, I guess I would say. Just a uh, question on technology. So this is a conversation that we'll be uh, taking up tomorrow night. Is it tomorrow night? Yes. General government. So uh, the city is proposing a, a, a chief information officer. Um, I, I posed this to the police department <coughs> and they pushed back on me saying that their systems you know, can't talk to our systems uh, and they're moving to a .gov and so Outlook works differently. I have some questions on whether or not Outlook uh, works differently, whether it's a .gov domain or, or not when it comes to help desk. But are there, I guess one, uh, and I'd love a response, and George, I know this is, you know, you sent me a, a Google Drive link. It's probably the only city employee that's sending me Google Drives uh, <laughs> versus PDFs. Um, so is there, um, are there opportunities coming out of COVID? Obviously we don't, 
everybody wants to be in the classroom, but we've learned a lot through uh, remote learning. Is there ways to uh, invest in areas that can get more bang for our buck, you know, going forward, you know, potentially bringing in learning experiences that are, you know, not available to us in terms of, you know, teaching kids how to code or leveraging other opportunities? That's one aspect of, of my question. The other one is, are there are there ways that, and this isn't a question for this budget, but I'd ask to think about it in the future, are there ways to um, better work across um, with the city if we are going to develop you know, more in-house um, expertise around this uh, to potentially reduce costs uh, down, the, down the road, but also think about how do we, how do we share data uh, more easily in terms of statistics and, 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 and really uh, advance uh, the work we do, but also allow people to see the work we do in terms of data visualizations, et cetera. So a huge question. Just <laughs> I think I get that one too, because I am the chief information officer, or chief technical officer as well. So um, speaking to the sort of student instructional side, I guess, uh, we do have uh, considerable coding instruction yep. Uh, starting at an early age with, with coding for bots and things like that, fun, engaging things that you can do with iPads and, and pieces like that, uh, tend to be run through our library media program at that level. Once you go on to middle school, you're doing game design pieces, working with Python and, and other tools. Uh, also, we have Python at, at the high school um, and much more web design pieces and, and just deeper coding that goes on uh, at the high school level that's an elective. Um, so we, we do a good bit with it. We're always looking to do more sort of engaging work at the elementary level, finding what what uh, what pulls kids into coding. Um, but um, we, we we have a pretty solid network. We're generally one to one now in grades two through twelve, and that's by design. We didn't didn't strive to be one to one in K through one, um, just because of the developmental appropriateness of it, and. As far as resources across town from city to school, we, we already do um, commingle several of our, our tools. We do the same security training as the, as the, the city through Neoscope. Um, currently our network administrator, I think is doing a lot of consulting with the city on some of their network issues. Um, uh, there, there are things where we run across different platform issues, Finance Plus, I would say, the, the ordering system is not is not Google friendly, and we're very Google we're a very uh, Google environment. We're we're in a pretty firm Google environment, and use all those tools for all our Google Classroom and and Docs. That's not to say we can't use Office tools. We do. It's all convertible and, and things like that. But so it's not necessarily seamless, but that's doable, I would say. And you're right. We could also use Outlook if we needed to. But and and we do have things refer from Outlook, if it comes into Outlook or it comes into a, a Microsoft server, forwards on to our Gmail, so, and vice versa. We do that back and forth all over the place. Um, so there's some things that it could be looked into that there could be some more efficiencies. But right now we do um, work together on several projects. I Thank work you. a lot with Alan Brady in the web, in the web as a webmaster too. Any other questions? All right. Guys made it through. <laughs> With that, um, we will open it up to public comment, I believe. I don't have the yeah, public comment. So if um, anybody that wants to speak, um, you're not uh, limited to uh, three minutes, but I'd ask that you keep it in your heart and your head. Um, as you approach the microphone, just let us know if you're a Portsmouth resident um, and your name. and. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Justin Richardson, 586 Woodbury Avenue. I just wanted to uh, ask that you support uh, the school board's proposed budget. Uh, they, I've watched the administration and the board work over the last couple of years. They're fantastic. I really support the work that they do, um, especially the work around mental health and recovery from um, you know, the, the mental health aspects of COVID are extremely important. I've seen it on the front lines. And um, I just want to stress that, you know, I was looking up the term, the lost generation, uh, because I really feel like we're, we're at risk for that right now. 
and I unfortunately have to run to pick someone up, so I apologize for cutting in line, and thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you, Justin. There's no line, uh, but if folks would like to form one. Uh... <laughs> And I do see uh, some hands on Zoom, so uh, once we go through the folks in the room, we'll... we'll... Perfect. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave, and for full disclosure, I'm a public school administrator. Um, I do have a question with, again, and this is nothing that Nate doesn't know. In the budget, it has 5.4% increase for health care, yet for, if you look at it, under school care in your budget, it's only up 3.9%. That's your fixed rate, that won't change. So this happened before and money came back because I brought it up last time. Um, I encourage you to look at that health rate, folks. It's fixed across the board. I brought it up last night and I will continue to bring it up, but there's some money there for you to bring down that $10 million budget. The other thing I'd like to bring up is the curriculum coordinator. Um, uh, I was here when we added upper management in the school. I was on, sitting in your spot. And I, um, we added, they added a, a, a assistant superintendent and a director of student services. And they moved some positions around. I actually even talked to the assistant superintendent at the time when they were gonna add that director of student services. And I guess I really would ask, um, what the assistant superintendent position is doing then if you bring on a curriculum coordinator. Um, I know he's done a great job, but he's done the curriculum coordinating. So my question is, what's the need for that? And I would ask you to look at other schools um, and really look at the benefits of that. Um, and if there is benefits, I stand here and I say I'll walk away. But I just always worry when we add a lot of upper management to schools. As someone who does, who got rid of their curriculum, or got rid of their special ed coordinator, so that it, that it could become a special two special ed teachers to work with kids. I think it's the most important thing you can do, is to work with kids. So I would ask because, again, I was on the council when we added a couple of man, um, management positions, and where it's not going to be filled until January, according to the superintendent tonight, potentially. I would really see, do we need that right now? Lastly, ESSER funds. We've heard about them tonight. Um, I'm assuming, like we all, who's someone who does full disclosure, work on their own ESSER funds in their school district. You've had meetings with families. You've had meetings with staff about those funds. You've had meetings at the board. I really have a hard time that we've added the BCBA to the budget. I, there's a couple other positions in there that I think could potentially be short term especially as we hear tonight that our kindergarten population is down. I would ask you all to look at the policies that the school has. Our school has a policy of how many children per number of teachers. Last year, one of the reasons uh, the superintendent gave up the position is the year before, I questioned that policy because it was pretty clear that we had more teachers than our policy had requested. We had, in other words, we had a lot less students than we had teachers according to our policy. So I would encourage you to look at the policies before you add these positions. Um, once you add positions, you can't take them away. And also, I would much rather see um, positions that maybe work for all students. Again, I'm a special ed director in my school. I live special ed every day. And I've been saying this to my own situation. Um, you know, the less we can, the more inclusion we can do. I would much rather see someone that's going to be there to support kids in the regular classroom, bringing in, using some of your ESSER funds, which is something we are doing in my school, to really say to the regular ed teacher, yes, we have concerns with our behaviors. We have concerns with our, um, some of our students. Some of the families are having a hard time right now but how are you going to work with that child in the regular ed classroom? So I would like to see some of that, and I didn't see any of that in this. I saw a lot of um, support staff being added, but 
I'm not sure just another special teacher is really what's needed, but more what's an inclusion teacher look like? What are we doing that we're using this money for differential instruction? How are we using this money to make sure that all children are in classrooms and they're not in some self-contained program, which means that a child is being pulled out and serviced with other children at the same level. Children do not learn in self-contained programs. They have to have other children that they want to achieve to be better. Um, lastly, to answer your question, Mayor, about looking at the CIP, a lot of those things in the CIP, there's been money given to some little thing, maybe a study or something, and you can't supplant on federal funds. So they won't be able to use that money anyway, or they won't be able to use the money for that because there would be potential supplanting because you voted on it and money has already been used. So it really has to be new projects. So I um, am appreciative of their answer to that tonight and I'm appreciative that, that, um, that we're not supplanting. We're following the federal guidelines and I know Steve and Nate know a lot about that and are really in tune to that. But um, that is one thing we have to worry about. We were given $2 million back didn't get used for community campus. It was a gift back to the schools. I guess I would really think about what we can do to lower this budget using those funds and give a gift to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Good evening, Petra Huda, 280 South Street. And uh, I'd like to thank the school department for the job that they did during COVID. I think we did a great job. Um, and just FYI, I do not have the data to look at that the council did. I am looking at the budget book for my information. Um, based on that, um, I, I'd like to, to understand the narrative um, on the first page, on page 372 in the school, uh, where they said um, the increase in the drivers is a restoration of instructions made by, made by last year in operating expenses, as well as strategic increases in FTEs. Um, we have had increasing budgets from 18 to current, um, just about by $3 million, and even all through COVID, um, we were we increased the budgets and we held, and they were they were fully funded and did not give back that much money. During this time, we also had um, decreases in enrollment. So um, I think we did a great job, and I think we had great funding. And um, what we're using this funding for, even even reallocating it, um, I think the all the proposals that were put forward. Um, seem great. Uh, the thing I would like to address um, also, um, I took my data from the uh, New Hampshire Department of Education. Uh, I, I found a bunch of different numbers as far as the school department versus the CAFRA reports and the budget, and I knew that the uh, Department of Ed had to be, had to be just as accurate. Uh, so to answer, uh, to answer one of the mayor's questions, uh, the decreases per the New Hampshire Department of Ed. Um, Little Harbor, um, from 2018 to 2021, uh, saw the largest decrease, and Dondero, less, and New Franklin, even less. So um, the question that is burning in my mind and that I look at when I'm looking at a budget is, do all of our schools get the same opportunity for funding or all our children get the same opportunity to have the same programs with the funding that city is providing through tax dollars. Um, and based on that, I, I guess I'd like to uh, ask a couple questions. I don't know if I could be answered in this, uh, in this forum, but um, if you go to your, uh, your detail, because God lives in the details for me, uh, on page 392, um, I'm trying to understand on the athletics 
uh, cost center number 115. Uh, we are adding a, a athletic director, and that was explained. Thank you. Um, I, I don't completely understand how the MOU works, but my question is, um, if you are adding the athletic director uh, on top there, are your contract services for pupils going to increase or decrease? Because we've had, we've had lower, higher, and then you took it back down. So I'm, I'm looking to see if that was the reason for the increase in two years or if it was um, something else. I'll just keep going, Nate. <laughs> um, the, uh, the next question is the statewide psychologist, um, system-wide psychologist, cost center 137. Um, it looks like we're adding staff there. Are we adding, are we adding enough for what we need? Um, and cost center 150. Um, this is PEEP, and it seems like we're going down here. Um, and looking at the state's enrollment numbers, uh, we had 2018-14, 2019-14. We decreased to three in 20, but then we're back up. So I'm trying to understand why the budget would be going down on that. The next one is SPED uh, Middle, Cost Center 152. Um, that's also decreasing. So uh, the budget last year was 902,780. This year it's 866. Um, again, in following the conversations, um, I, would, uh, I would ask if that has been looked at. Uh, English. English second language, um, we're adding a para there. Uh, in, in listening to the discussions, the, the next question is, is that enough? Just a para. Uh, last one probably is uh, school board, uh, number 171. Uh, we're adding $30,000 in contract services admin, and I guess I would I am very curious as to what that's for. Uh, the last one on page 397 is technology. Uh, I had the same question almost as the mayor there. Um, we have software, which is increasing uh, continuously. And then we have new info system equipment. So is that the same thing? I mean, we have quite a jump there from uh, from last year, last year we were at 145.26, this year we're at 210. So um, I guess in follow up to the mayor's questions, uh, are there any uh, economies of scale we could, we could realize there as far as in-house systems or is this involved with, uh, with actually teaching and, uh, and learning? Uh, the last one uh, would be on page 399, pupil transportation. I guess I'd ask if um, at the point in time when this was done that um, the uh, cost of fuel was taken into consideration or we're going to have to deal with uh, surcharge on that. And uh, I would ask you to look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Any other speakers? Uh, we have one. Oh. Hi, my name is Sue Polidora, 245 Middle. And I just um, wanted to bring a few uh, bits of data to you, especially regarding the schooling. In between jobs, I served as a um, substitute teacher, both in Hampton, Portsmouth, and then New Franklin. I did Little Harbor, what was my favorite. Uh, middle school, high school. Uh, I was in a lot of schools because I was very accessible at the time, so I got a lot of calls. 
uh, I'm familiar with our environment. And I have to say that thinking about education as though you cannot say no to is a wrong position to, to take as a council. We do well with our schools, all right? But this is what is happening in the economy. 8.3% inflation, which is the highest in 40 years, was just announced today. 1.2% GDP. Three consecutive terms, quarters of GDP at that level is a recession, all right? Um, the Fed just went up 0.75 basis point because they're trying to bring down inflation by creating, recalling some of the money that had been spent for the last two years, bring it back by increasing um, interest rates. There is 2.3 trillion in personal debt out there. Now, the city needs to, to keep in mind, the city council needs to keep in mind that the five points uh, percent, almost five uh, percent increase that the school board is requesting is also going to be on top of that inflation that many of the your taxpayers are going to have to pay. So uh, added to that reevaluation coming up, so you are looking at at least 12% increase on whatever it is you're trying to do budget-wise in the city because of just what is happening in the national economy. Please do not think that what you do here is independent from what is happening in the national economy. I lived here for a long time. I have seen at least five recessions. I think that there's only just a couple of people in the days that remember some of those recessions, they were pretty bad, and they hit the area pretty bad. So when you're working on budgets, you cannot work independently for what is happening to the rest of the state and nationally. It will come to touch us somehow. You need to keep that in mind. People cannot absorb this kind of inflation, of increase to a budget without pain, and they will let you know what that pain is. I love the quality of, of education, even though sometimes I feel like I ask the kids, I'm, I'm big into civics. I ask the kids that I come across from our Portsmouth uh, uh, School District some basic questions about the area. Very, very few times do I get the right answers. And that is an issue with me. Also, the program that you spoke about, uh, English as a Second Language, why don't you ask people from the community to volunteer? English is my second language. I can teach it, I can teach it as a volunteer. And I know many people out there that can do the same. Believe me, I can pass any kind of background, uh, 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 um, background information that you would like to have. I had a security clearance when I was in the military. So it's like, why don't we just go into these things that we know the community can get involved rather than creating positions with funds that will go away at some point. And I congratulate the school department. I really enjoy working with them when I did my, uh, my stint as a uh, 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 in, in the schools, I was one of those teachers that kids would love to see the second time because they finally realized that having a substitute was not a party day <laughs> when I was in the classroom. So anyways, um, kind of jump, skip around a little bit on that, but this, this decision on this budget cannot be made separate from what is happening to the national economy. That's the message that I wanted to give you today. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Novelin Clayberg. My address is 405 FW Hartford Drive. Um, I have the honor of being the chair of the school board, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. 
Um, my co-chair, um, Margo Peabody, and I had several conversations with our wonderful city manager, Karen Kennard, and our mayor about the, ESSER, the use of the ESSER funds for the community campus. Unfortunately, it looks like that's not going to be able to happen. But we are so grateful and thankful to the City Council for continuing the conversation of having our Lister Academy program go to um, the community campus. That is just a wonderful collaboration. You guys are great. We just love you because it looks like we're going to be able to move that program over to the community campus. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for working so well with us. Um, we have three new board members this time, and it's um, been interesting. It's been a learning curve, I think, for all of us because we've had to review a lot of um, you know, situations that you go through when you put a budget together. So it's been a good experience for us. We're happy that you um, are being so cooperative and wonderful to work with. You know, I've been around for a while. I'm in my 22nd year of being a public official, an elected official in the city. And um, this has been a very, very, very positive, uplifting, and wonderful experience for us. So we thank you for working with us. And before I sit down, I just have to say thank you to Steve Zedreveg, our wonderful superintendent, who's been with us since 2005. Is that right? And we are thrilled he's moving on to SAU 50, which means he'll still be working with us, particularly in our high school. So with our Greenland Rye Newington Newcastle contingent. So we're very happy about that. And also George Shea, who is our assistant superintendent, unfortunately is leaving us also. And um, we are thankful for what Steve has done for our school district um, for so many years. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I love this collaboration. I love this cooperation. Um, I think, you know, there are obviously conversations that will continue regarding this budget, but it's been a pleasure to work with you all through the mayor and our city manager, and I think I'll have conversations and we'll have conversations with all of you as time continues. So thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, and. Uh, Thanks for dropping the bomb on us that uh, George is leaving. So thank you. <laughs> oh, for a while. So we, sorry, we are uh, disappointed uh, to, to say the least. But I uh, trust you're going somewhere great. Hi, I'm Lisa Rappaport, 139A South Street in Portsmouth. I am on the school board, and I will be very brief. I am incredibly grateful for you taking so much time to ask such smart and thorough questions. I know you don't face easy decisions. We obviously are in a really challenging time with our national economy and a lot of people are struggling. But I just want to add one thing from a personal note just from speaking to so many parents and teachers in our district. People are really struggling and you know you see numbers that make it look like enrollments down a little bit each year. But what those kindergarten classrooms look like right now, there are kids that are coming in that have never been in a classroom before. You know, they spent two years at home with working parents who can't give them all of the enrichment that they wish they could because they're working with the kids on the floor next to them with an iPad. You know, we have teachers who have kids, it's not that they can't read their colors and, you know, they don't know the words for the colors. And it's nothing to do with how smart these kids are, they just haven't had that environment. So, you know, I just kind of want to put that idea in your head. I'm not a numbers person, I don't envy you having to crunch these numbers, but, you know, in the middle school kids are coming in and, you know, behaviorally, socially, emotionally, they're not middle schoolers yet. You know, they are still learning how to behave in an age appropriate way. You know, we had, you know, an administrator at the high school talking about how kids were playing tag so aggressively at a high school dance that they kind of had to shut down the party and give them all a talking to, and that never happened before. So the amount of just extra work be beyond reading and math and writing and science and all these basic academics that our teachers are doing right now is just vast and huge. And they have their own families at home that they're dealing with just like all of us. And so I just encourage you to not only look at those numbers, but also just consider as you look at the budget, the incredible load that our teachers have taken on, the incredible stress our students and families are under right now. And just keep that in your minds. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask uh, to bring forth uh, Ken Buttermore. All right, can you guys hear me? Loud and clear. 
All right, thank you very much. Ken Buttermore, um, I've got two kids that go to Don Darrow and uh, live at 545 FW Hartford Drive in the city. Uh, I wanted to say um, that I stand in full support of the school board's proposal here and uh, was very happy to see continued investment uh, in our kids. I think a lot of what Lisa just said um, kind of stole a little bit of the thunder <laughs> of, of, of what I had prepared to say, which you know, the punchline here is as our teachers and administrators on the ground here seem to um, have more to do than they can possibly have resources to be able to accomplish. And, you know, I, I just encourage us to continue to invest in our kids. Honestly, as a finance person, I was a little bit surprised to see only a 5% increase in a hyperinflationary environment, um, especially whenever you kind of look at what's happening to the property tax base around us. So, you know, I asked, are we investing enough? Um, uh, it, but obviously defer to to the experts who have dug in here and seen what we really need to be successful and just encourage us to continue to invest in our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And that is it. Uh, I will uh, thank everyone. Um, again, uh, Mr. Shea, you might have had a, another plan to roll that out, but we are no, no, grateful no, no. for <laughs> the opportunity to thank you for, you, uh, for the um, uh, the work that you've done, um, uh, New Franklin, and then the you know the whole city got to enjoy uh, your work. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and uh, to the to the speakers, thank you for coming out tonight to the school board. Uh, thank you for putting uh, a lot of time uh, into it. I think you have an enormous amount of challenges, opportunities um, that that lie uh, ahead of you, and and we look forward to continuing uh, this conversation. And for the speakers that pointed out the, the human aspect and, and told us this, this is a budget meeting, so life isn't lived in the numbers. Um, it, it's lived uh, between those, but numbers are important. But we appreciate hearing uh, just the, um, the, the, the cost um, and the, more than the cost, just the uh, the stories of, of what kids have, have gone through, um, parents have gone through, um, and having a child that is going to kindergarten, um, you know, it's made me thought a, a lot more of, you know, how prepared is she? Uh, I feel fortunate that I believe she is, but there are many parents that are not in the same position uh, as I am, and so thank you for bringing that to light. And I, I leave just with one story. Uh, the, uh, the amount of substitute teachers that have reached out to me um, just thinking how uh, great the school system is to, to work in. Um, unsolicited, uh, really appreciate that, you know, there's a need for substitute teachers, but you've created an environment where they feel as though they are uh, giving back to their community uh, in a very positive way and a great work environment. So uh, thank you to the school department, everything uh, that you're, you're doing. And, uh, Nathan, you're not allowed to leave. Uh, so <laughs> I just want you to know that in case you're getting any thoughts. Amen. <laughs> All right, with that, uh, I'll uh, close this uh, meeting and um, we're back here tomorrow night uh, for General Governor. Thank you very much.